There's Providence St. Oh, whoops. Yeah, right? Let me try again. <clears throat> Dr. Ellen Mahoney is Providence St. Joe's Hospital's Cancer Care Program Head, and Priscilla Lynn is the Area Director of Oncology Services. Judy, could you mute the um, your room so we don't get all the background? Thank you. <clears throat> Um, Dr. Mahoney will present a brief history of the cancer program at St. Joe's and introduce you to the cancer care resources and treatments available at St. Joe's uh, in Humboldt County, Providence part of it, because Providence is all over. <laughs> Since 2010, Dr. Mahoney has been the medical director of the cancer program at St. Joe's, and she served as the medical director of St. Joe's perioperative services since 2007. She's a former interim medical director for Hospice of Humboldt. She trained as a surgeon at Stanford and graduated with her MD degree in 1981. And by 1986, she'd become chief resident in surgery at Stanford. Before going on to become a board certified fellow of the American College of Surgeons in 1993. She moved to Arcadia in the year 2000 and opened her own practice in breast cancer surgery. She speaks frequently on breast cancer in community groups, serves as a medical editor and expert contributor to the website of the Susan Long Foundation, Love Foundation, a nonprofit organization dedicated to the prevention of breast cancer through innovation, education, research, and advocacy. And she just was telling me about a new program in palliative care they're going to be introducing. But that will be for another day. So it's all yours. Okay. Well, I want to introduce Priscilla Lind, who's here with me. And uh, she's uh, our nursing director and uh, the person who actually gets the work done. I just sit around here and spin ideas. And uh, Priscilla gets them all activated. You want to say anything about <laughs> that? Uh, so I am actually, um, I've been a nurse for 26 six years. Um, the vast majority of that has been in oncology. Um, and I actually just relocated to the area um, a couple of years ago, um, really getting to know this area and this program. And one thing that I can say is that um, I joined this um, program and found um, the, the level of quality here in Humboldt was um, it was heartening to be able to join a program with this nature of quality. And we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about that today. Okay. Yeah, let's go ahead and start the presentation. Yes. And I'd just like to tell everybody that uh, to save your questions to the end. Okay. So, and put them in the chat. Yeah. Some, someday we'll have to have a discussion on the influence of gender and career paths, but um, I didn't necessarily come here voluntarily uh, 25 years ago, but my husband, who I wanted to stay married to, decided mid midlife that he wanted to leave his Stanford faculty position. And uh, admittedly, I had a better job there than he did, but uh, I wanted to stay married. So I eventually moved up here myself, kind of reluctantly. And uh, I've come to realize that the opportunities here for me have been much better than they would have been if I'd stayed in Palo Alto. But when I got here, I found, first of all, that we have a very large uh, area that we serve. And uh, it's about the size of Connecticut. And there's one cancer program in that whole area. And there are challenges for our population in terms of distance and terrain and weather, as you all know and weather inter interfering with distance and poverty. And uh, this large service area, it was a challenge. And in fact, um, there wasn't any cancer care in Humboldt County until the 1970s. And when I, at, when I did the needs assessment back in 14 years ago, I started out with asking people, what did you do um, if you got cancer? And you know, they, to a person, they said they either stayed and died or they went they moved out of town, at least for a while. So um, it was clear that something big needed to be done. But the background right now is that we have a, a comprehensive cancer program. This is where we are 14 years later. Uh, we deal in prevention and early detection, uh, community education, diagnosis of cancer, um, 
comprehensive treatment for most cancers and cancer support services, which um, we're gonna be enhancing uh, in, the, in the coming year. And we try to give this service close to home because that's where people need to be treated if at all possible. I must say that when I was at Stanford, I was on the other end of the uh, attitude saying that, oh, everybody ought to come to the university if they could have something serious going on. And since I've been up here, I've realized how incredibly impractical that is. And since a lot of the health policy people are based uh, at universities, it's something to have to uh, overcome that attitude that maybe this shouldn't be happening out here. But uh, as I think we'll show to you, we do a good job. So we work together, it's collaborative. We have um, a weekly tumor board where everybody meets uh, for a joint problem solving uh, conference, multidisciplinary. And uh, we have genetic counselors, we have social workers, we have nurse navigators, as well as physicians and nurses attending. And also uh, one of the things we've done is we've included and encouraged primary care physicians to be there to either present their patients or to be there when we present their patients because we figure that that relationship um, is very important in knowledge about the patient. It's not enough to know how to treat the cancer. If cancer happens in people, it doesn't happen in test tubes. So um, we need to actually uh, tailor our treatments, best practices to that patient and what they can do. So this is a recent picture of a great deal of the staff. It's probably about 70% of us. It hasn't always been this way. Uh, the, the first person to offer any kind of cancer care in Humboldt County was Dr. Bruce Kessler, who some of you may know. And uh, Dr. Kessler was challenged by Scott Holmes when he had a patient with breast cancer to say, it's crazy that we don't have anybody who can give chemotherapy for this woman. I just finished operating on her. She had lots of nodes involved. What can you do about it? And Dr. Kessler uh, had trained at Stanford. He, in fact, he was a medical resident when I was a surgery intern. And uh, he had a nurse in his office who was also still around, Kathy DiCiola, who was so skilled she could start a peripheral IV that could take chemotherapy safely. And he called down to his professors and uh, got the recipe and started treating people, which inspired the medical community at that time. Uh, this was the time, you know, where we had Eureka Internal Medicine, Arcata Family Practice, Eureka Family Practice. It was a dream type. It's the, it's the medical community we found when we moved here. Those, all got, those guys all got together and uh, applied for a National Cancer Institute grant. And they got $900,000 to say, how can we bring cancer care to this area with all of its challenges? Um, the outcomes of that grant were radiation oncology, which we didn't have the numbers to qualify for, but it was clear that for a treatment that has to be given so frequently that the only way to really do it for a community like this was to have a radiation facility. We also um, established the home base hospice program and uh, Hospice of Humboldt started. And then we also began our accreditation process through the Commission on Cancer. And at the time that happened, most treatment for cancer was sequential. And people usually had surgery first and followed by chemotherapy if they needed that and then followed by radiation therapy after that. And when I did the first needs assessment, I was interviewing patients. It was interesting to talk to people who carried their x-rays around from office to office, but nobody had given them the whole picture in advance. So they would have surgery and they'd say, okay, well, that's it, right? I'm okay, it was tough, but I got through it. And they say, oh no, now you're gonna go see medical oncology. So they go see medical oncology and they finish that treatment. And they say, okay, that was tough, now I'm done, right? And they go, nope, now you have radiation. And uh, it, was, it was a time when patients just were in a dark room on a treadmill, not knowing exactly what was gonna happen next in their cancer care, something that needed to be, to be changed. So I became involved in about 2010 after moving here. And the same year, Dr. Liu also came here from the University of Texas. The only two uh, employees in the program were two cancer registrars that abstract data from medical records and feed it into the national data system. Um, both of, Dr. Liu and I are university trained. We had no experience with the Commission on Cancer accrediting things. And when we started looking at 
charts, we found some major problems with care here and the outcomes were not good. Um, and it's not surprising since nobody had re-looked at the program for years and years and also the, the field had changed a great deal in that time. So we embarked on surveys and um, some of you may have gotten surveys in your doctor's offices. We had interviews of various people um, and we uh, brought in some outside experts because at that point, radiation and medical oncology were not getting along. And uh, when it became clear that we needed to up our game in terms of cancer care, uh, Joe Mark was the CEO and he gave us gave me Tim Talbert, who was a very experienced nurse. And then Tim and I hired Linda Rasmussen. In that early time too, um, Dr. Korsauer retired from her job in the uh, Student Health Center at, at Humboldt State. And when she found out what we were doing, she volunteered her old Volvo and went all over Humboldt and Trinity counties and uh, gathered data for a needs assessment, which is still a good document to see where we've come from. But uh, it was in, she was our first volunteer and was amazing. Long story short, the major problem we found was with the referral system, that over time, uh, cancer care had become more collaborative and multidisciplinary. And people were used to that sequential system, which I described before. And um, the primary care docs who were up to date knew that it was multidisciplinary, but didn't know how to get the patient into a multidisciplinary assessment. So what they would do is send the patient to surgeons. And at that time, the surgeons were um, probably 20 or 30 years out of their uh, residency. They were not aware of all these changes. And so by the time that medical oncologists and radiation oncologists saw the patient, they'd already had an operation. And in many cases, that meant that their best chance at a good outcome had been squandered. And so we needed to find a way to get people to work together. And uh, that's where the tumor board uh, really was improved. And it's, it's become sort of our nerd prom every week. Um, people just love going to tumor board. COVID uh, damaged the in-person part of it, but we're coming back to that now. And uh, we still have a pretty re um, uh, healthy uh, remote response for it to bringing people in that couldn't attend in person before. So we improved the tumor board. And then the other thing we did is we brought in the NCCN guidelines, which were relatively new. They had started in the 1990s. And that's a series of best practice guidelines that are generated by experts from, uh, very, I think it's now 33 universities who meet regularly and each university sends its expert in that subfield of cancer care. And they read all the literature that comes out for that particular site of cancer and they update their guidelines. So the challenge out here becomes how do you apply those guidelines to a particular person with their preferences and history and other medical problems, et cetera. We also, um, because we had the, the uh, association with the universities, we have very good relationships with the universities. I think we have everybody's cell phone number on our phones. Um, and just as background, some of you have heard about Dr. Hardy. He and I were at Stanford training at the same time with the same faculty. And Dr. Risha was also trained by the same faculty, but he was, he's younger, so he was in a different time. So there was, there was a good uh, unified outlook on how this ought to be done. Uh, the turning point in terms of organizing cancer care as a business around here was when Dr. Jeff Allen arrived. And he did not want to have a private practice. So medical oncology was in three separate small private practices uh, around the area. Radiation oncology was at, well, it moved from general hospital in a trailer to uh, having the vaults and the facility that we have now in the Russell Pardo Radiation Oncology Center. Um, and uh, Dr. Allen challenged the hospital and the medical group to provide him with a medical oncology practice inside the hospital. Um, so later on, of course, uh, the, it, beca it became actually, we went from the Heritage Medical Group to the Providence Medical Group and the Providence Hospital System. When Dr. Allen came, uh, Dr. O'Brien saw that we needed somewhat more facilities. We didn't have what we need to have everybody under one roof, which is what's ideal. But he gave up uh, the convent, which was used to be urgent care, 
when I started doing this, urgent care had just been closed. So that whole hallway of, of convent rooms was empty and my office was in there. So I had my own kitchen and my own bathroom and empty ideal office. But we put the oncology, medical oncology clinic in there. And then for chemo infusion, uh, Dr. O'Brien actually gave up his, the executive offices and, uh, and turned that into the place where people get infusions and chemotherapy now. So this is sort of the general idea of what we treat uh, in terms of largest numbers of patients. We obviously get some very challenging cases that are very unusual and we're, we have a reputation for coming up with some oddball cancers here. But for the most of it is the ones you would expect, you know, GI cancers, breast, respiratory, et cetera. What I, um, I'll tell patients that most cancers arise in tubular structures in our body. And all these tubular structures are aligned with cells that have certain lifespan and need to be replaced. And every time they need to be replaced, it's a chance for the cells to make a, an, an error copying themselves. And when you accumulate enough errors on other errors on other errors, you have cells which go rogue. And uh, this is obviously breast is breast ducts, the, the tube, the bronchi and the lungs, uh, GI tract is obvious, et cetera. We have urinary, et cetera. We have also a fair number of hematology consults, uh, but for cancers that people think of most of the time, it's things, tubes in the body. So, mm -hmm. yeah, this study just came out in July and I'm a little behind in my reading, so I just found it last week. And it's from the Journal of Clinical Oncology, which is a pretty prestigious one. And they, these are people who are health policy types looking at the idea that rural cancer care is not safe and that their mortality is higher in rural areas. And they, they did an in-depth um, analysis of this, but they found outliers. So the outliers were in urban areas where there was higher mortality than expected, and that's in red. And the blue areas on this map are where lower mortality than expected is found. Uh, in rural areas, and they speculate about how this could happen. You know, maybe this urban area is uh, far enough away from cities uh, and no cancer programs, and maybe in the rural areas that do better than expected, that they're close to a city or there's high socioeconomic levels or something, but none of it applies to us. And you can see by looking at this map that the hi highlight of Humboldt and uh, Trinity County uh, light up like a light bulb. We have much lower mortality than expected. And uh, that was pretty exciting to see. And I don't think we have any of the exceptions or thought reasons that they thought that might be the case. So this um, made us think, you know, what it, what are the things that we attribute to being able to have, um, you know, better mortality, um, better outcomes than what is expected, what was expected because of our the, our rural nature. And we immediately go to some of the things that we have, you know, we, we have been awarded, um, we have several awards and accreditations um, and those accreditations and awards, they, they're, you know, they're, they're based on us meeting particular guidelines and standards. Um, for the American College of Surgeons, the Commission on Cancer Accreditation, um, that's, a, that's a book this thick of, of rules and regulations and requirements of what we need to do to be able to meet those standards. Um, we have to prove that we are doing all the things that make us a quality oncology provider. Um, and they have, we do a, a periodic review with a, a surveyor. Um, every three years, we have to have a surveyor come through and, and look at our program and, 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 and really test us against those standards. And we have to prove that we're meeting those standards. Um, in fact, in October of 2023, that was our last survey and we had a perfect survey. Um, we, they they uh, went through all of those standards and said there was, you know, very little room for improvement that we had made. Um, you know, we'd really done a great job. This is really unheard of. Um, there's 1,500 um, accredited, about 1,500 accredited sites by the Commission on Cancer throughout the United States. 
And it's really very uncommon to come away without any findings. We, we want them to show us things that we could do better. And that's part of their job. They, they, you know, they, they spend time searching through to try to find ways to make it better for our community and for the patients that come see us. And so it was a really big um, uh, accomplishment that we, that we achieved last year. Um, those COC standards, they, they encompass things such um, as early detection, staging, treatment, and survivorship. And that surveyor was very, very um, complimentary of our, of our program when he uh, did our survey in October of 23. Um, in, in addition, um, some of the other uh, accreditation or uh, I guess awards we have received, we are um, a center of excellence for the go-to um, uh, foundation for lung cancer. Um, and this has a, a lot to do with um, our low dose CT screening program. Um, and it's not just about the fact that we have low dose CT screening, it's about that we have a whole process around capturing those patients who have had their screening and following up with them to ensure that they follow up appropriately, whether that's entering into potential care or just continuing their screening on a regular basis. And then also um, in 23 and 24, we were um, uh, um, recognized by US World and News Report um, for, as a high performing hospital for colon cancer um, surgeries. And that uses uh, data like nurse staffing, um, the number of patients, survival, mortality, et cetera. So um, that it just shows that those um, that are high performing are significantly better than others, uh, other facilities in the nation. Along with, um, oops, I keep clicking on that button. Um, you know, we, the other thing that we really ascribe our, um, our great outcomes is the people that we get to work with. Um, namely, you know, we are uh, we are blessed to have some physicians um, that are nationally recognized, um, and uh, Dr. Mahoney is one of them. Uh, last year, she was chosen as one of ten out of the out of fifteen hundred uh, cancer liaison physicians. Um, she was awarded by the Commission on Cancer for her outstanding role here. Um, in addition, um, in the last several years, she was also awarded um, the Plessner Award from the California Medical Association, also very prestigious, and um, she's well known throughout California. Dr. Liu is one of our radiation oncologists, and he was recognized um, in a 2023 into, as an ASTRO Fellow. ASTRO is a national organization for radiation oncology, and his, um, he was recognized for his contributions to the field of radiation oncology. These physicians, other high quality physicians and providers in our program, as well as team members such as nurses, radiation therapists, and support staff are, we believe, a very dedicated crew that have contributed to the excellence and outcomes that we saw in that previous study. So I'm just going to um, transition a little bit into our program specifics. Um, so I start with cancer support services. Cancer support services is a um, department, a sub department really of the cancer program. And um, this, this department came about right when Linda Rasmussen started um, in quality and accreditation in our program. And it was actually at the time, very, a very novel idea today it's pretty common for a cancer program to have a cancer support services sort of department or at least those this these people. But at the time it was actually very novel and forward thinking to be able to have a team of support staff that um, kind of help through the journey. They're not just about being in medical oncology or in radiation oncology or during the surgery, you know, or, you know, but when they're very involved all the way from the beginning of um, even in sometimes in the nurse navigators, in the inkling of someone thinking that they might have a cancer diagnosis, they may be involved. And then working them through that whole, um, that whole uh, comprehensive process. So we do have two general nurse navigators. They ca coordinate care from screening and diagnosis. Um, they, they touch point with 100% of our medical oncology patients at the beginning of their care. 
um, and they're very focused on concurrent patients and head and neck patients. And then we also have a full-time oncology social worker. Um, and we'll go into the details on their on their roles here in a second. And then on uh, a full-time oncology certified oncology dietitian, um, uh, she is, it's actually very uncommon to have a certified oncology dietitian. It's something um, in all of NorCal Providence, she's the only um, oncology certified dietitian. Um, so as I mentioned, the navigators, um, they uh, work on several things to kind of keep our program and our patients well taken care of. Um, we have a nurse navigator that manages our lung screening program, um, that low dose CT and managing those findings. Um, we have a navigator who is very specialized. At this, um, one of our specializes in head and neck patients because that coordination of care when patients are getting radiation therapy and chemotherapy at the same time, they it's a very complex um, care situation. Um, as I mentioned, they contact all patients who have re been referred to medical oncology. They're that first um, that first voice on the other side of the phone that says, "We're here to help. We're going to get you through this." And um, they are two very dedicated staff um, and um, are a great first first. Uh, view of our of our program, they do it. Um, they do work to assess for barriers to receiving care right in that beginning conversation, and then get the social worker, dietitian, or other services that they a patient might need involved. Our oncology social worker, just to jump into her role a little bit further, she um, definitely does a lot of psychosocial support, a lot of res resource referrals for things like food distribution. Um, uh, helping patients if they need uh, to have meals delivered, et cetera. Helps get connected patients with Evergreen Lodge, which is another amazing resource that this program has that is um, very forward thinking and having the Evergreen Lodge for our patients right on site. For those who have to travel far to have frequent treatments, they're able to stay in um, in Evergreen Lodge, right in the hospital uh, parking lot, essentially, and be able to walk to their treatment, um, saving them cost. It's very, it's very inexpensive for them to stay there, and just the um, the stress of having to drive back and forth to their home frequently if they're far away. And then our um, oncology social worker also works on transportation assistance, which is a, a huge barrier in this area. Oh, I somehow, oh, uh, so we also, a little bit more about um, Whitney, our oncology certified dietitian. So she is, um, she has a lot of work in doing nutritional counseling and education for patients during treatment um, and then uh, help support dietary supplements. She is very involved with those patients who need any kind of tube feeding Um and helps support patients nutritionally through their treatment. Um, she also uh, does community outreach with us to educate the community on the impact of diet as a controllable factor for cancer prevention. This photo here is she is, um, we are actually at a food distribution event where she takes the um, food that is going to be distributed and she makes a custom healthy recipe make samples and then has people try that recipe with the with the food offerings and sends them home with a recipe. It's been a really great hit and um, a really um, wonderful uh, way for her to get out into our community. Okay, so, you know, they could have the greatest doctors in the world, but they'd be nothing without a passionate and open-hearted staff that comes to work every day to serve the community. And, uh, the morale amongst the staff is very good. And uh, I educate them once a month and they are sponges for the science of the of oncology, which is becoming just absolutely fascinating. It uh, seemed to be stagnant for a while and now the progress is exponential. Um, the challenge for us with all the success is to stay, stay self-critical. And uh, you'll see at the end that we definitely are doing that. We we are not content with this, despite all the awards and uh, all of the nice words that we get from the national accreditors. Uh, we know that we can do better. So we are working to put ourselves out of business and that's what screening is about. 
We want to find cancers when they're uniformly curable, the earliest stage when we can't prevent them. So low dose lung cancer screening. The trouble with lung cancer is that it's got a great big space to grow in before it causes symptoms. And so most people, by the time they were diagnosed, were stage three and stage four. These low dose CT scans are meant to be done every year. And they're like a mammogram for the lungs and people who are at risk for lung cancer. And you can start seeing little stage one lung cancers and take care of them at that point. We've also been helped recently by the addition of a pulmonologist to our staff, Dr. Robert Young, who is a great, great guy in, in addition to a great human being. And uh, he's bringing to us uh, some real improvements in lung cancer care. Breast cancer screening, we've uh, added another 3D mammography system. And uh, we had a mammography event yesterday. Uh, I think that most people know that uh, this is a, the best way to prevent death from breast cancer since we can't yet prevent breast cancer itself. Although the first work on that was done here in Eureka and that's in the textbooks, but uh, there is a way under, underway, uh, there's assessment for how to prevent breast cancer by removing the cells that lead to breast cancer. Colorectal cancer screening, you might remember Get Screened Humboldt from a few years back with uh, all of the, the uh, public service announcements on TV and the, the baseball cards and all of that. Uh, we're still doing well, and that's where we got hope for the lung cancer uh, screening program because in the colon cancer uh, program, the reason that was done was that we saw an excessive number of people who were uh, diagnosed with high stages, so poor prognosis. And then we, with time, we got to see those stages come down. So instead of a lot of stage three and fours, we were seeing stages one and two, and we we're starting to see that same effect with lung cancer screening. Um, prostate cancer screening, the primary care physicians are coming back to the idea that PSA was uh, a good idea. And certainly uh, they're more humble about it than they used to be when they were denying PSA tests. Um, and then pap smear and HPV tests uh, are, are uh, to be discussed with your primary care or DYN uh, provider. There is a real push to get younger people uh, vaccinated against HPV since so many cancers, including head and neck cancers, uh, various cancers of the urogenital tract come from H uh, the HPV. Uh, infections early in life and they, getting the immunizations, uh, even though it's, you know, it's got a bad name because it's, it's associated with sexual activity, um, but at some point, I think all of us expect our children to engage in sexual activity. We should get them vaccinated. So um, next. In terms of diagnosis, um, this is where the, a lot of progress has been made. Um, genetic testing we have a genetic counselor who tunes into Tumor Ward. She's based in Santa Rosa, but she does her consults by video. Uh, genetic testing is what you've inherited from mom and dad. So half of your genes come from each one of them, and hopefully you get all normal genes. But in some families, you inherit a few of those mistakes already made for you so that it takes fewer events in your life to get to cancer. And genetic testing actually helps us design uh, particular surveillance programs for people who are at extra risk and may not even know it. So genetic testing is, is valuable. We're increasingly testing people who are diagnosed with cancer for genetic abnormalities. Genomics is looking inside those cells. I call, I call this CSI for cancer. They look inside the tumor cells and then look inside the normal cells and say, what changed in the DNA between the normal cells you were born with and the cells that are in the tumor, and how did these how did these cells acquire the ability to become cancer cells? And uh, when possible, and increasingly it's possible, we have specific therapies that are aimed at those mutations, and this is leading to a change in the field where instead of looking at size and location of tumors in the body and what organ they came from, we are doing something called histology agnostic treatment, meaning we, we're treating the mutation wherever it is in the body. Uh, and that's the, that's the basis of immunotherapy. PET scans are CT scans with an overlay of where extra metabolism is happening in the body. 
Um, we have uh, great CT scans and MRI, We're getting a new couple of new MRIs, and we have interventional radiologists who can help us do biopsies by uh, taking um, pieces of tissue from areas where we find abnormalities on imaging. Uh, all of these people are at the tumor board also, and there's a vigorous discussion about which way we should approach a patient's diagnosis. We have some good general surgeons, and we have a couple of really excellent young general surgeons who come to the community. And I mentioned Dr. Young before, our pulmonologist. Um, he is bringing endobronchial ultrasound, meaning you go through the wall of the bronchus and into the lymph nodes and take a sample there so that you don't have to uh, open the sternum to get to the lymph nodes that are in the center of the chest. Uh, he's also going to bring for us a, uh, a new technology, which is to go down the bronchus and then out into the lung tissue itself and harvest small nodules that are seen on imaging and just take them out as a whole thing. Again, avoiding surgery, which uh, for anybody who's known anyone who's had a chest operation, they're very morbid and they're hard to recover from. So th this we have high hopes for. In terms of treatment, we have the medical oncologists and, and we have um, ambulatory infusion and also chemotherapy infusion, two separate uh, parts of the program which are under our care. And uh, the nurses there are super. Um, they take the orders that the medical oncologists uh, uh, prescribe and apply them to the patient and generally ha often have vigorous discussions back and forth about how the patients are doing. The radiation oncologists, we have four who could work anywhere in the world they wanted to work. And luckily they like to work together and they like to work here. So um, we have Dr. Liu, Dr. Harmon, Dr. Kelly, and Dr. McDonald. And uh, we have radiation therapy department, which is, is excellent. I've been a patient there myself recently, not for cancer, but for uh, severe arthritis. And uh, I was very impressed by the care with which they, they, they take in taking care of patients. And then the surgeons I mentioned before. So just to delve a little bit further into um, our capabilities for treatment. Um, so we, um, the Dr. Russell Pardo Radiation Oncology Center is on um, the Northeast corner of our hospital campus, right here on campus. And we have two linear accelerators. That's what's pictured there in that machine or in that picture is a, is a linear accelerator that's, um, that uh, provides external beam radiation to treat cancers. Um, we have um, a lot of advanced uh, uh, radiation therapy services such as IMRT, um, SBRT, uh, stereotactic radio surgery, and we also do high dose rate brachytherapy, um, as well as standard um, 3D conventional therapies. Um, and so, you know, we have, um, as, as Dr. Mahoney mentioned, um, four radiation oncologists that are um, very dedicated to this program and have been here for 30 plus years. Um, we have, on average, we see about 340 new patient consults in the radiation oncology department and treat over, there's 7,200 treatments on average per year. So a very de busy department. Um, these linear accelerators are um, within the walls of the hospital, which, um, you know, kind of helps be, uh, be able to have a program, prog programmatic effect, effect. We were, wish we were closer all together um, to be able to coordinate that care a little bit better within our hospital. But it's a it's a major focus of ours to be able to provide that very coordinated care. Um, and then the other side of the um, treatment coin is the hematology oncology cl clinic and chemotherapy infusion. And so we um, we are again th that's on the northeast corner of the hospital campus. Um, we have fourteen chemotherapy chairs. Um, we are currently stable with the support of three physicians and two advanced practice practitioners, to, uh, their nurse practitioners, um, but we are still continuing to focus on the stability of the medical oncology physicians. 
Um, some of you may know Dr. Ellie Risha. Um, he is he is uh, our medical director for the medical oncology side and is our primary hired medical oncologist. He works remotely and we've actually been um, recognized within Providence for our telehealth program with him because we have taken some novel approaches around telehealth um, where we actually have, um, in many cases, telehealth is a physician in an office and the patient is at home. And in this um, case, we've done it the flip. The patient's in the office with all of the support team, the MAs and the clinical staff and like our nurse navigators and our, and our social workers are all there to support that patient. And the physician is actually in his home calling in. And we've done um, a lot of work around trying to make sure that patients feel like they're just as well encompassed in the care um, with that telehealth visit as they would be if the physician was right in the room with them. Um, we actually see about 500 new oncology or hematology patients um, in a, a year in the oncology clinic, medical oncology clinic. And um, we have in the chemotherapy suite, um, we, I lost that number. Um, to 13. Is it 1300? Oh, you're talking about numbers. Nope, nope. Well, um, I, I will pull 14 out. chairs. Okay. Yeah, we have 14 chairs. Anyways, I'll, I will get back to you on that. But um, so we, in the chemotherapy suite, actually throughout our program, um, we have a high percentage of oncology certified nurses, which is um, recognized nationally as a, as a, a marker for great care. Um, this uh, being certified as a nurse is a, a very difficult exam. It's um, proctored and it is um, considered a, a professional certification, board certification. Um, our program started with just one oncology certified nurse. She was a radiation oncology nurse. And um, we just really have a long expertise of growing um, our own staff into being um, excellent providers and becoming certified. Um, it is. It has been long term our practice to be um, to kind of home grow our own, and our departments are sought out for for employment both internally. Um, people want to come work in this department because of the excellence um, uh, that that occurs here, and um, we're even sought out. You know, when people learn about our program from without, they they want to come be a part of it. You didn't say Go how ahead. many we have now. Oh, uh, so we're at about 60% oncology certified. And as I mentioned, that is actually a very high certification rate. Um, and uh, I do believe it's also the highest amongst the NorCal um, Providence sites for pro cancer programs. Okay. Um, so just have a little, I'm going to make sure our settings are correct. Um, a, a quick video um, that helps highlight um, our, our cancer infusion program. My name is Leah McCrane. I'm a charge nurse here at the Chemo Infusion Center. The one thing about being a chemo nurse is that you not only get to see the patient on a regular basis, you get to actually know them. And in some ways it feels like they're kind of a big part of your life. The start of my day is we have a morning huddle and we go over every patient for the day, things that they may need, what will make them more comfortable. We have sometimes up to 40 patients a day and in all different areas of cancer. And we have a great team and we talk throughout the day. We are all about communication. We spend more time together here than we do with our family. So it is kind of like we are a family here. There will be times when you have people that are doing very well with their treatment and don't need a lot of support. And then there are times when you have some very sick people here. They're sometimes spending their last days here with us and we want to make them as comfortable as possible. When you are there for that person through everything you can go through through chemo and they come out of the other end of it, it is one of the most fulfilling things to see. They get to go out about their lives. They have their children, their family, and come back and say, hey, remember me? 
I've done this, this, and this, and to know that they are on the other side of this and we help them get through that, it is um, an amazing thing to see. So um, Providence's promise is know me, care for me, ease my way. Um, and I think that is absolutely in the heart and soul of, of our program. And I think it's really evidenced there. I think I just want to make sure that, um, you know, the, our community knows that um, we have access to all of the treatments that, um, you know, the larger centers that traveling far from here would offer. Um, we have very uh, high excelling physicians and nurses and radiation therapists and other clinicians. Um, we, I, I forgot to mention in radiation oncology, uh, we grew our own dosimetrist. It's a very, quite unheard of to have a local dosimetrist and, and physicist. Um, those two people are instrumental in creating those radiation therapy plans. Um, in many programs, they're fully remote and we have on-site support of a physicist and our, uh, a dosimetrist that grew up from being one of our therapists. So, um, you know, when I hear about people leaving the community for treatment, um, I, I, I want to make sure that they know that we have the availability of really excellent um, care and top notch um, following the same NCCN guidelines that any other organization would use. And, um, and I, it, you know, we can save a lot of financial toxicity and stress by keeping patients here locally. Okay. Oops. So a little word about surgical services. Um, I actually started my medical directorships here at St. Joe's um, as medical director of the operating room, which I did for 10 years, uh, including the transition from the old operating rooms to the new tower. And uh, when I started, that new tower was about to open and I looked at the floor plan and I said, you know, you don't, these, none of these rooms are big enough for a robot or really a servo controlled operating system, which we were using at Stanford, but it was pretty new in the world. And I got some pushback saying, well, we're never gonna have one of those here. And I said, I think you better be ready for it because it's gonna be important for treatment. It's gonna be important for recruitment. So <clears throat> we'd already had all the approvals from the OSHPOD, which is the certifying agency at the state of California level, but I made a case and they spent a million dollars to move a wall. And we now have rooms big enough to hold uh, our current robots. And this year we got one. So we're training up our surgeons on the uh, robotics. Uh, and, and increasingly as people come here out of training programs, they're already well aware of how to use that. So um, robot is really a misnomer. It's servo controlled, meaning that surgeons at a console and uh, there are technicians who put the instruments into the patient and the, uh, the surgeon is operating by video. So uh, it, it lets uh, you do complex operations which are lo with a lot less blood loss, a lot less morbidity, and uh, people recover faster, and that's the goal. So we have, um, you know, we have, we have good management in terms of breast surgery, colorectal surgery, lung cancer treatment. Uh, Priscilla mentioned SBRT, which is small body uh, radiation therapy, meaning you can, instead of taking out a small lung tumor, what you can do is do four radiation treatments and get the same results as you'd get if you'd actually done surgery on that patient. So uh, that's increasingly uh, used, especially for patients who have other comorbidities. Uh, we have ne two neurosurgeons and a uh, urology, et cetera. Uh, we have excellent vascular surgeons. Among the reasons not to leave the county is Dr. Holly Haight, who's our new joint replacement surgeon, who uh, gets wonderful results, does all of her hip and knee operations as outpatients and sends a physical therapist around to your house the afternoon you get home and uh, starts your physical therapy at home. My own husband had his knee replaced by her and uh, it works. So uh, we have eight operating rooms, and then we have procedure rooms for endoscopy and for, cardi for cardiac uh, procedures. 
So we have overall 9,000 operative cases a year. And when you put everything together, the operations, the treatments for medical oncology, the surveillance for people who've been treated and are being followed, the radiation treatments, we're seeing about 31,000 patient encounters a year and uh, for, in our program. Uh, it, by the way, in, in the for the breast surgery part, which is what I know the most about, um, I have an in the in the operating room X-ray, so I can take the angles of the lumpectomy from different uh, uh, aspects to see that whether or not it looks like I have clear margins. The problem with that is, of course, the the uh, pathologist gets a chance a week later to tell me that there's still some microscopic cells at the edges, but we do our best this way. And we also have gotten away from wire localization, which I always thought was a particularly brutal way of find, trying to find abnormalities on mammograms that you can't feel. And uh, we've gone to a um, system right now and we're uh, microchips, just like you put in your pet and those microchips are placed near your biopsy site and taken out when you have your operation. Uh, we're looking at some other uh, systems to see whether there's anything better now. So in terms of community outreach, we do a lot of that. We want to be a part of the community. And you'll see in the next slide, this outreach is crucial in terms of our being integrating ourselves into the community, being part of the community, and improving our care and services to people. We've recently done uh, health fairs at Kamau out in Hoopa and at the Bear River uh, area. And uh, we we have uh, National Cancer Survivors Day at, at the Crabs Park. It's kind of ironic that the crabs, the same symbol for cancer is a crab, and we happen to have a crab mascot. So we got the cover picture on their magazine the first year we did it. And uh, we we do our best to try to take all the different types of cancer and, and educate the, the community whenever we can. Uh, if you haven't seen the inflatable colon, you can walk through for it yet. Um, Please come to one of the health fairs and see it. And looking forward, this is where I said we have to remain self-critical. We don't stay self-critical, we get complacent. And we have these wonderful cancer support services, but people bump into them now and basically when they get to a crisis state. And uh, they, in addition to the the ones that were mentioned. We also have financial counselors and financial toxicity and medical bankruptcies are big news these days. We don't want our patients to go through that. Um, and we don't want them to wait till they're suffering to find out that we have a support service for them. Um, this was shown by our sister uh, facility in Santa Rosa where they noticed that the snacks they put out for patients were disappearing at a great rate and came to realize that many of the cancer patients were hungry and put a food bank inside the cancer center. And uh, that's one thing we hope to do. Um, we, we want to integrate better uh, in, in terms of having all these approaches, including wellness, uh, uh, yoga classes, dietary classes, integrative medicine. We're just, we're, very activated in terms of trying to find all the ways we can partner with other providers and community members who aren't traditionally part of the cancer program and apply what they can give us to the uh, cancer program for the goodness, the good of our patients. So um, non-drug approaches, we have a nurse practitioner who comes from a palliative care background and we hope to uh, have his skill throughout the course of people with serious cancers so that he can help with symptom management, but also if, when the time comes, if it does, that treatment is becoming futile, he helps to recognize that, and we don't have to wait for the inpatient uh, team. Uh, we want to treat the whole person, and we talk about lifestyle, conventional medicine, et cetera. So stand by, because that's gonna be our focus for the next, you know, it's our next big project in terms of making cancer care here uh, equal to and better than what you could get anywhere else. That's that, I think. That concludes um, our presentation and we can uh, stand for questions. Yeah. And I think I see some in the chat. Okay, then the, the fourth book might be when it starts. She, <laughs> she um, there are a number in chat. 
Yeah, yeah. and I can see that. Could yeah. you all mute her? No, no. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So we can start at the top. Um, uh, explain the tumor board. Okay. The well, tumor board is a an hour and a half or so every week where particularly challenging or difficult cases are presented to the whole group. So uh, you can imagine uh, the dilemma of a medical oncologist or a radiation oncologist who just sees a patient for the first time and they've got all kinds of things going on. Um, an example recently was our pregnant patient who had breast cancer. And so as nobody would be caught off guard when she walked through the door for the first time, I presented her at tumor board so that everyone got acquainted with her case and anyone who had ideas for care, put those ideas into the hopper so that we all knew where we were going with that. And this is a case too, where we uh, did get advice from Dr. Hope Rugo down at UCSF. And uh, she was very willing and very generous with her time. And we got this, this woman who had discovered a breast cancer when she was six weeks pregnant, actually delivered a healthy baby boy. So. And we, we introduce these patients who are, have particular challenges to the whole group. And uh, it's done at lunchtime. Uh, the, uh, as I said before, there are a number of people who are there on the video screens, but also a number, increasing numbers now who are back being in person. And everyone who treats cancer, and everyone who takes care of cancer patients, including a number of other nurses and primary care docs, uh, nurse practitioners, practitioners in the community uh, tune in. They get uh, continuing education credit, but they also get to um, interact with the cancer program so that they get an idea about how we approach problems and we get an idea of the things they know about their patients that would take us a long time to learn. I hope that helps. Anyway, we also have a radiologist and a pathologist. So for any case that's presented, we have the story is told, then the radiologist goes over the films uh, that are relevant, and the pathologist goes over the uh, cellular details that are known, and then there's a discussion about how would you approach this case. And uh, notes are made and sent out to everybody, and uh, that's that. Next question, Leslie says, is there a blood test for cancer yet? There's a blood test for some cancers. There's the old AMCAS stuff was basically a scam. Um, there's obviously PSA is good for prostate cancer and has to be interpreted carefully. We have the shield test for colon cancer, which is hopefully is going to replace uh, Cologuard, et cetera, especially for people who find it distasteful to do that test. Uh, reserving colonoscopy for people where we actually have to look at the inside of the colon. Um, so that's coming. Uh, there, there are by sites, but I think it's there are, although there are mutational similarities between some cancers, they are different enough that the diagnosis so far is um, is probably more specialized. One example, what one exception I mean is the liquid biopsy, where sometimes when we can't get a biopsy of tissue by any means, we actually just take some of the patient's blood and look for DNA fragments in the blood. And uh, oftentimes, especially if we say, we know the patient has cancer, but we don't have enough tissue to run the genomics uh, and do the analysis of where the mutations are. We can find those in the blood, in the peripheral blood. So that saves the patient an operation. So between CT scans, which basically eliminated exploratory surgery, and um, this technology, we're actually being much less invasive than we have been. Um, Jane asks, when someone is diagnosed with cancer, what are the next steps or the process for the patient, and how is melanoma treated? Okay. Well, we started out forming the intake clinic, so the intake team. So the intake team was the schedulers, the nurse navigators, and me, and we took on every single referral and started out with saying, does this patient have a home? Does he or she have a phone? Do they have insurance? And... Uh, what are their what are their needs in the community, and then what are their needs with respect to their specific cancer? So that the first visit with somebody to take taking care of them is not just a social call to order tests, but that some of the tests are already done when they come through the door. Time is important in cancer. Um, sometimes not as important as people think, but still we don't want to dally about it. So if we can get uh, some of the primary care providers who've referred the patients to us to order some of the tests in advance. 
uh, and that's again, according to guidelines, uh, then we do that. Um, but now the nurse navigators have taken over that function and they're doing a great job. And uh, they're also coordinating people who need both radiation and medical oncology so that instead of having appointments in those departments a week apart, uh, we actually um, have them in the same day here. So that saves gasoline in, in an area where there's poverty. People don't have a tank of gas to, to donate to coming into this cancer center. So we wanna do our best to make sure that the financial toxicity is again, as low as possible. I, it's, I guess that, how is melanoma oh. treated? Yeah, increasingly with immunotherapy and increasingly successfully. The trouble with melanoma has been uh, when it's at higher stages, we have more trouble controlling it like a lot of other cancers. Uh, and there are other details in terms of the mutational uh, aspect of the melanoma. They don't all have the same mutation and the ones who have particular mutations are treated more effectively. Uh, and uh, the ones that uh, that don't have that or at earlier stages sometimes don't need any systemic treatment at all. Anne asks, if a person gets an oncology consultation at Stanford or UCSF, is the local team able to follow up on the suggested course of treatment? Yeah, so we have a number of patients who have done that. And uh, first of all, the person at university increasingly says, listen, we know the people who take care of you up there in Eureka. Um, they know what they're doing. And if you came here for your treatment, you'd get exactly the same thing that they will give you because we use the same guidelines. So if there are particular tricky cases, we actually send the patients down for a second opinion and they make suggestions and we do implement those suggestions and work in conjunction. I, I mentioned Dr. Rugo and the pregnant patient um, you know, when, when I uh, first started this journey of medicine, people who got pregnant while they had breast cancer had abortions, no matter where they were in their pregnancy. And uh, now we know that we can actually save the baby if the mother wants to do that. Um, but again, we have certain chemotherapy agents that we can use that don't damage the fetus. And uh, we can then delay some of that treatment until after the baby is born and uh, still have good outcomes. So um, that's where we are. Um, Bonnie asks, when I was finally diagnosed with gynecologic cancer in 2015, I was told there was no like local gynecologic oncologist here. Is that still true? Yeah, and probably will always be true because the volume of GYN cancers is low. And so that's the exception whereby we can prove that the outcomes are better if people go to a, a university center to have their operation and their initial evaluation. And uh, because this, the surgeons there are up on the latest techniques for how to remove the tumors and how to analyze the, what's going on with the patient. And then they have their own tumor board. They make suggestions. The patient comes home and recovers here and gets the rest of the treatment here. So um, we, we do a very good job of coordinating for GYN oncology patients. And uh, this is a good place to mention the Breast and GYN project in Arcata, uh, very important in terms of helping patients out. But uh, I think we will always have uh, GYN oncologists outside the area because local GYN surgeons should probably not be doing these more complicated operations. And they, they admit it now. Uh, Tom says, I'm eight years uh, no evidence of disease from stage three CRC with rising CEA levels. Um, driving to OHSU mm -hmm. and um, would who would he contact to talk about wound care? I think just uh, do you have if you have a primary care person and you're lucky enough to have one of them, they can refer you here. Um, otherwise, just call the call us and tell us that you need to be cared for, and uh, your people at uh, OHSU will. We'll probably work with, I mean, I know they'll work with us. We've had other mm -hmm. patients where we do that in conjunction with OHSU. So they, they know that you'll want to be close to home. And uh, if there's anything tricky about your case, they will advise us on what they would do if you were there. And we'll take that out and stay in, stay in um, discussions with them as you progress. Now, the, the other thing to remember is CEA is a, is a bit of an imprecise blood test. There are lots of things that can make your CEA go up temporarily and then come down. So, uh, you know, sometimes it's sitting next to somebody who's been smoking or uh, a viral illness or something. So 
it has to be a steadily and consistently arising level before we get excited about it. And then we there should be diagnostic tests, which can be done here or there to see um, if we can find the site of the extra CEA. It's a primitive protein that, that some of those cancers put out. Not all of them. Kay is asking, what is the solution to um, prime, not getting primary care doctors or to getting primary doctors care and dentists here for patients, knowing that that's a problem with how the access is? Yeah, that's, a, that's what's really changed in the 25 years I've been here. When I got here, there were lots of primary care docs. They were all very activated, very excellent. They greened out in the 70s and early 80s. And uh, we had a very vibrant medical community. Um, there's a lot of things that have happened in the interim. One is that uh, with uh, the hedge funds, et cetera, taking on medicine, uh, the, the amount of money that gets down to the local level is less than it should be. Uh, young people are not incentivized to go into medicine anymore. And that includes all specialties, uh, all types and dentistry too. Uh, smart young people are going into finance or tech and not going into medical school or dental school. So that's part of it. Um, we have, of course, taken a lot of foreign medical graduates. You may notice an increase in doctors with funny last names. Um, and that's great, except that we're pr providing a brain drain for those countries that they come from. And that's not fair either. We should be growing our own. So um, there you know, if increasingly now, is if you look at a career in medicine, it's a vocation rather than a profession. Uh, and that's changed the characteristics of medicine. And having corporate medicine where they tell people how long you can spend with an in individual patient, et cetera, is a system that at some point is just going to have to be broken. I, I'm not sure how it's going to happen. Um, what we've done locally, uh, Dr. O'Brien set this up, but we started growing our own primary care docs because you're right, there are 65,000 people in this county who don't have a primary care physician. So they're not getting screening uh, unless they go to a screening event and they show up in the emergency department when they are symptomatic and often they have advanced cancer at that point. So that's really awful. And uh, we have managed to keep a couple of the residents that we've trained and, uh, and liked. And uh, we have a loan repayment program for people who will stay here so um, they actually there are two different sources of funds for uh, paying off their medical education loans and if they have a 10-year commitment to the area. And uh, we're hoping that will help too, but it's all going to take some time. We also increase the number of, of doctors we train every year from six to seven. And uh, we have a, a lot of people who apply to this program. Apparently, the family practice residency program is excellent also, and uh, the leadership seems to be good. Um, how effective is immunotherapy for the different cancers? We're figuring it out. Uh, sometimes very effective. And, and uh, say this is relatively new. It's, it's coming out in the guidelines. The, uh, the, the people who are experts in the various sites for the NCCN are meeting regularly, looking at the scientific evidence and making suggestions. But we're in the process of acquiring data now to, to find out. Um, it's not as easy to... to um, to uh, have done to you, or it, it sounds like it should be uh, gentler, but it's not necessarily, It's a, it can be a difficult treatment. And let's see. Oh, I think Tom's just responding to, yeah. your, to okay. your answer. Yeah, thank, thank you, Tom, let us know. Yeah, Tom, good luck to you. And, and we'll mm -hmm. be happy to partner and keep you here. And uh, I think you'll find you'll love our staff. I love our staff. <laughs> okay. Um, <laughs> Julie says, one of my humble heroes, all of ours. Um, yes, thank you very much. Any other questions? What's the primary thing that we as residents can do to help? Oh, wow. Um, gee. I guess from this point of view, um, to reassure people who are being treated here that there's no magic out at the universities, I'll tell you that having come from one, uh, and in fact, one of the problems with the university, and I'll say this to somebody who was a junior faculty member there, is you can go down there for a consultation and get a junior faculty member who then years later will, will cringe and say, oh my God, why did I tell those people that? 
I didn't have the experience to say that. Um, what you want, what used to happen is that when you went to the university, you got the gray haired guy who'd been at it for a long, long time. Um, and that doesn't happen all the time. So it's good to know the name of the specialist you're gonna see, make sure it's somebody who's got some mileage on them. And, uh, and if necessary, uh, go and see them. But maybe it's best to start here and find out if it's necessary, find out if there's any controversy about how you, you should be treated that would be um, clarified if you went to the university. And I can add, you know, I mean, I think that's one of the major reasons that we wanted to get um, get on the OLLI um, uh, agenda was because we wanted to share this kind of arm you with some information about what we have available here. And also, you know, be your own advocate. That's something that um, for patients we tell all the time is like, you know, if you, you can always um, advocate to, to, um, to be seen here and know that, you know, our physicians aren't going to keep someone here if they can't handle the treatment that is needed. Um, but for, for a vast majority of the cancers that we're seeing in this county um, and beyond, you know, we are capable of those. Um, and then also, you know, question if you go out for surgery, maybe you go out for surgery because it's a larger surgery than we offer here or um, because of timing or family or something that is more convenient to go for surgery. When that surgery is done, if there's follow-up treatment that is needed in radiation oncology or medical oncology, um, again, advocate for coming back to your community because over time, the success of that treatment, you know, um, you don't want all the complicating factors of adding travel or, or delays because of the airport, et cetera, um, creating uh, a potential downstream effect on your treatment. So, you know, advocate for yourself um, and for people in our community to be questioning whether um, whether it's possible to be treated locally. I guess the other thing to help in terms of helping us is we're now embarking on this uh, new assessment. It's been 14 years since we did a comprehensive needs assessment and looked at ourselves. Other people have looked at us in that 14 years and uh, patted us on the back, but we're not happy yet. And so we'll be going out to the community and uh, doing surveys, questionnaires, et cetera, and trying to elicit people's uh, experiences and reactions so we know where improvement is needed from the patient's point of view. Have you considered getting funding for someone to actually do a study of, of that particular issue, in other words, interview people who just went through treatment and how it worked and the outcomes? Well, Do you have that go ongoing? I, I think probably part of it is my job. Um, and we, you know, we have had, like Dr. Korsauer was a great volunteer uh, early on. Uh, I don't know how successful we'd be getting a grant for that, but uh, it's certainly worth looking into. Uh, I, I think that this is probably something we'll we'll do homegrown. So, is it possible to work with one of the nursing pro with the nursing program to see sure. if you can get it as part of that program? Well, part of this whole person care, we want to work with everybody. So we're going to be going out to the food bank, to the area one agency on aging, to uh, the VA, um, every other community uh, organization that deals with cancer patients <clears throat> to see if we can partner more strongly and to see their impression of. Uh, how we're doing. Have you ever surveyed the local doctors? <laughs> yeah, we did that. Yeah. And we were at that at first we were looking for a university partner and we surveyed everybody on terms of what university they would want to see us uh, tied to. Right now we're working with all three Northern California universities. So and, and occasional others outside, but because of the poverty level in our community, we need to be able to have Medicaid coverage for most of our patients. And uh, that means staying in California for universities. Yeah. Are there any other questions from anyone? If so, speak up or forever hold your peace, or at least yeah. temporarily. <laughs> I miss hearing your voices, but I, this chat is nice, but still. Yeah. Uh, yeah. <clears throat> oh, Dr. True is great. I Julie, absolutely... you have a question or is that a, an applause? <laughs> 
Thank you. I think that's an applause. Well, we okay. really appreciate your coming to present this, that you're offering it up to us. I appreciate every time when we get a brown bag proposal from the outside rather than my figure. <laughs> it's I a blessing. You do. Yeah. yeah, it's less work. I'll yeah, exactly. I've got 28 of them a year, so I'm very okay. happy when we get volunteers. Um, and and you in the community can also uh, let me know if there are subjects in particular you want to have covered. And I think I'm going to I'm I'm going to be talking to Dr. Mahoney about do, talking about this complete care program and uh, about uh, how to deal with hospice. When when death is certain, how to deal with hospice and palliative care and how that. Well, when I floated the idea of whole person care and coordinating our care better, it was really in validating that the staff just got very enthusiastic and we they're all volunteering to be part, you know, do part of this. And uh, they're all plenty busy. So some of it's going to have to be off hours, but they're, they are very eager to help with that too. So. That's fantastic. Well, thank you ever so much. And I want to let you all know that next week we're going to be talking about a mindful approach to stress. And the concept is that stress is possibly one of the major cause, causes of disease. Um, <clears throat> but in any event, uh, Eiko Michaud is a professional and she will be presenting on that topic next Monday. So we look forward to seeing you all there. And meantime, have a great week. Don't get too nervous. Thank or anxious. you. Don't get too stressed before the depression. <laughs> Thank oh, you. Wow. Thank, Thank you, you very all. much. Take care. Okay.